church. We are the church. This building, and, and, and as we go through, we'll talk about all that. All right, one thing, though, that I want to encourage you to know that we got supposed to have four sessions. Therefore, tonight you may be disappointed because we may not talk about what it is that you want to talk about. So if not, then just know that there's other, other sessions. Also, uh, one of the things that we are trying our best to do is to let God lead us in uh, what we're going to do. So right now, I just want to do a prayer. And uh, this may be a little different than you typically do, but if you want to watch and read along with me, we have this prayer. That's fine. I wrote the prayer yesterday. And uh, so we just want to pray it right now. And Corey Ken Boone taught me something. She said, you pray just as good with your eyes open as you can with the closed. So, now I don't know if you know Corey Ken Boone, but not go you know, look her up. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we come in praise, honoring you, glorifying you, and acknowledging that you are the creator of this universe and of this church called FBC Huntersville. Your honor and your glory above anything that we can imagine. We have trouble believing that you love us enough to call us your children. Yet your holy word tells us that we are. Help us, Lord Jesus, to know that as the Savior of this universe, we love you with all of our hearts and minds. Father, in the name of Jesus, we confess to you that we are sinners. We have disobeyed you. We have done things that we know are against your will. We have omitted things that we know we should be doing. We have not trusted you. We have allowed the evil one to influence our lives in many ways. We spend far more time listening to those paid to influence us than we do studying your word. We spend more time planning what we want to do to please ourselves than we do in prayer to you. We let children go hungry while we pile up stuff. We let our friends and family hurt when all they need is someone to listen to them and to love them. Oh my goodness, that big thing's not too good. You taught us about forgiveness, or if we forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive us. But if we do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus, we beg you to remind us of these words every time we fail to forgive those who sin against you. Help us to remember that you forgave us as we forgive. As we forgive. Help us to remember, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. <clears throat> Jesus, you taught us about forgiveness. And Jesus, thank you for making it possible for our sins to be forgiven. Thank you for the peace that you send to us. Thank you for telling us that the eye is the lamp of the light. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Help us to open our eyes and ears so that we can see and hear and hear what you have for us. We thank you for our church and ask you to bring healing to us. Help us to remember that we have to love you and obey all that you have told us. Jesus, we pray for those who are in need of knowing you, for those who have special health needs, for those who have mental health issues, for our leaders in our country, state and county. We pray for every member of our church body. Bless those who lead and minister to us. Teach us and help us to love each other. And thank you for the abundant food that you give to us. Thank you for Action L, the folks that he serves. Thank you. Help us not to let a single child go hungry. Provide for those who need jobs. Create in us a desire to help with world hunger this year. Give us a vision for what you plan to do. Open our eyes, minds, and hearts to see the work you're doing here in our midst and to join you because we love you. Jesus, please take over this time today. Use it. Please let the Holy Spirit in us, lead us to see, to seek your wisdom and guidance. Help us to see what you have in store for all of us individually and as the body of Christ. In the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Which gears here? All right. Let's see. I'm going to put the light off just a minute so we can see the light. I just love that picture. That kind of gets the whole, you know, most of the world. We're working together. 
We noted for calls, not for ourselves. Uh, this will go to help those kids from Haiti, help feed those hungry people, help feed some of these uh, folks here in, uh, in Huntersville that are hungry. Go to the, some of it to the soup kitchen, some of it to the food pantry. So, you know, to me, this this just represents what we as a church can be. Now, it takes a lot of work and a lot of people and it probably is the event of the year that we do the most cooperating. Where we are together. And we have a few little spats about who's doing this, who's doing that, but in general, most of the time, you know, we're really, really working to get that done. Alright, Romans 12, 5. So in Christ we are many who form one body, and each member forms to all the others. The body that is formed is the church. Now, tonight, there are people in this room that are angry. There are people in this room that are confused. There are people in this room that may not even know what their emotions are. Now, God can handle all of that. But one thing I have got to do is allow him to do that. All right, now, the question that I have tonight, do you believe this verse? Do you believe that in Christ we are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others? I have a sister. Occasionally I get a little bit aggravated at her. But that does not mean that I don't love her. So now here in church when we get aggravated with each other or aggravated at a group or whatever it is, that does not give us permission not to love them and not to work together. So when we take off and start behaving in that way, then we have moved away from the Lord. Perhaps one of the greatest challenges for Christianity in our day is for churches to walk with God so closely that the world comes to know Him through their witness. There are a couple of places in the Bible that teaches us um, John 13, 34, New command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And now there are a couple of, couple of versions that say the world will know me if you love one another. So the way the world will know Jesus will know God is by the way we love each other. That is our witness to the world. Now, if who is left out of this command? I. Nobody. If we obey this command, what are the results? The world is attracted to Jesus. If we don't obey this command, what is the result? The world is not attracted. The world's not attracted to Jesus. The world is looking and saying, you know, well, what's going on down there? What are those people doing? Who are they? So, you know, if, if we won't. And we, whether we like it or not, we are being observed by those around us. So one of the questions that we as a church have to answer is, what do we want those out there watching us that we didn't ask to watch us, what do we want them to see? Whether we like it or not, 
what they see and hear is our witness. What they see and hear is our representation of Jesus. So they will uh, know Jesus by that. Uh, I don't know, any of you like Philip Yancey? Well, Philip tells some pretty neat stories. One of the stories he tells is that he hated Easter as a youngster. But then to go back, what happened on Easter was he had a little kitty, just a baby kitty. And so they got ready to have the neighborhood egg hunt uh, one Easter when he was five, about five years old. So they carried the little kitty out in the yard, and uh, the neighbor's kids brought over their bulldog. <laughs> well, you know the rest of that story. So, uh, you know, he prayed over that kitty, begged God to resurrect that kitty. The kitty didn't resurrect, so for years he hated Easter because that was his experience of Easter. Uh, he was talking to a prostitute, trying to witness to the prostitute. She uh, had a baby and a little, little child and uh, so forth. And, and he invited her to church and he said, she, she says, no, I'm not going to church. I, all they do is make me feel guilty. So, you know, I'm not going. I'd rather go anywhere than to go to church. So, basically, you know, what she, the churches that she had seen, had, had made her feel like, you know, the church wasn't uh, the place to be. So now, a lot of these things, you know, we, we don't have anything to do with that. We can't control people outside of us. But, we need to be aware that what they see and hear is their witness. And, and so if, if we say that we want them to know Jesus, then we need to make our plans and so forth where we will, you know, work on that. Now, Jesus gives instructions at the beginning of the church. Uh, Acts 1, 4. And next time, I hope everybody will bring a Bible. If you got it now, if you want to look in that Acts, on one occasion when he was eating with them, he gave them a command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So now here... When they, then they gather around him asking, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And there are some of you tonight so are going to look and say, Bev, what is it that we're going to do to restore First Baptist Church? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates. The Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from sight. So now, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So now, the power to heal our church is sitting right here in this room and a lot of houses out there tonight. The power to heal us. God has already given it to us. And we're the ones that are going to have to decide to go ahead and move with it and do what needs to be done. Now, a little bit later over in Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly they sound like the blowing of a violent wind came upon from heaven. And filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated, came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak to each other in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of 
Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What, what have we heard three times now? You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is indwelling us as we accepted Christ as our Savior. And He has the answer to what we need. But we've got to let Him do His work. So we, we've got to you know, get ourselves to the point that we can let that work happen. Alright, so uh, to repeat, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. What does it mean that He has made Lord and Messiah? Wouldn't it be good enough to just say He has made Lord? Well, Messiah is our self. It, is, it means He saves us. Yes. And our Lord means He's in charge of us. That's right. So, so the Messiah is the one that God has promised all along from the time the Jews were formed. They have been looking for the Messiah, the Savior. And then to our Lord, we submit to Him, and He is the one that guides us, directs us, leads us. So here, this is very clear. He's made, made you know, He's both Lord and Messiah. Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ will forgive us for your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, look at this verse 35, 39. The promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, you know there are some things in the Bible that aren't very clear, but it seems to me like that is pretty clear. Who's, who's he doing all this for? Everybody. And see, we didn't have to do a thing except accept it. All we had to do is take it. So, for all whom the Lord our God will call refers to all. All of us. All of them then and all of us now. Larry, I like to tell the story about uh, Davidson Gray. Dr. Tuckett. I don't know if you remember Dr. Tuckett. Mm -hmm. well, Dr. Tuckett was uh, Professor Davidson's back in 1963. <laughs> <laughs> and he took all of us new teachers and you know, was going to train us right. And uh, so he, basically he, he said, you know, since we're doing this this night, if I want to talk about the Lord, I can. It's not in the daytime, so you know there's no restrictions on what I can say to you. But he said, we hear all this stuff about all these college graduates leaving, you know, leave college and they'll go back to church. He said, if you go check on them within five, six, seven, eight years, they're all back in church. But uh, one, of the, one of the graduates he told us about that later ended up being a preacher, he wanted a new viewer for his graduation dress. This was 1960. One or two, so you know, new group then probably be as expensive as one now. I mean, you know, relative to the situation. Well, when graduation occurred, his daddy bought him a present, and it was a Bible. He got furious. He threw the thing over on the shelf and never looked at it. When his daddy died. He was kind of sorry for what he'd done. He went, picked up that Bible, and opened it, and right inside it was an envelope with a check in that was the cost of a Buick for that year. What had he done? Not used what was available to him. The money, you know, all he had to do was open that thing up, and, and you know, and he would have had the money to go get his new viewing. But, but he didn't do it. So, Gerald, it'd be like somebody going along putting a million dollars in your checking account, and you never bothering to look at your balance, you know, and keep living the way you're living <laughs> because you didn't know that you had 
So, you know, the Holy Spirit in us is a gift that is so awesome. We just have a hard time believing the power that God gives to us. Regular little old people. Why would God give us such a gift? But the Holy Spirit is the one that, you know, He's given it to us. And Alright, when we receive baptism, we accept a new life in Christ and His family, the church. Therefore, we have been buried with Him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Hey, y'all memorize that, right? So what happened when we were baptized? We were, the old part of us, the spiritual part was washed away and we were raised to new life newness in Christ and we received the Holy Spirit well what if in my mind I didn't do that then I'm not going to take advantage of what God has given me so, you know, somewhere in there I need to really be aware of, you know, of what, what God has done for us and the, the immense gift that uh, He's given us. All right, at the baptism, at the time of baptism, our old spiritual self died. Jesus raised us to new spiritual life as part of the children of God, the church. So this is the church, right? Here, along with all those other members that... You know, are here tonight. So, do you believe that God wants us to see every member of the church as our spiritual brother or sister? Well, what if we come to church next Sunday and somebody's not there? Well, Henry Blackaby. Now, I don't know some of you. Some of you had experience in God. Some of you haven't. But Henry Blackaby said, there was a girl in our church. Now, Henry was a preacher. He says, she came to me and said, take me off the road. I have joined the cult. I want nothing else to do with this church. He looked at her and said, no, I cannot take you off the road. God is the one that put you in this church, and I am responsible for you, and I will not let you go. Of course, she turned around and walked off. But it wasn't but a few years before that young lady was back. Back in the church. Healed. Now, this is a big concept for us to, to deal with. Actually believing that every person that God puts in this congregation is a brother or a sister and that he, he wants that person See, good enough for those on. Mm -hmm. Was it too bad? Okay. okay. Uh, to, to believe that you know every person here, and that that we are responsible for to God for the people that are in the church. And uh, you know we could take the rest of the night on that one idea. All right, I got a little film clip. Uh, this film is called uh, The Gospel of John. Uh, it is from the Good News Version, the American Bible Society. I uh, remember the year that uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion came out. This came out about the same time and was swamped. Now I guess which one's seven more. Not The Passion. Now, this is like three and a half hours. It's two days. And uh, once you start it, it's hard to stop. But every word spoken in this comes straight from the Good News Bible. So I'm going to start with 
almost verbatim. It is. It, well, if you had the, have you got the Good News Bible? No. But if you had the American Society's Good News Bible, every word, I mean, there, there's no word spoken in this film that is not straight from the Scriptures. It's pretty neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, those sects, the ones I really like, are like the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, uh, uh, just the, the, the part about the Holy Spirit, and we'll look at the part about the Holy Spirit uh, next, next time we'll use that clip. Two things. Look at how they disrespect Jesus and at how strongly Jesus comes back and what he says to them. Any questions about that? Did you like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's, that's uh, there is also one about Paul uh, that is uh, similar to that. All right, now, this is, <laughs> in, in actually what I was commissioned to do was to use chapter 10 in Experiencing God. Well, I used a little bit of it, but a lot of it, but here are the five points that he makes that Henry Blackaby makes in the experience of God. The church is a creation of Christ. The church is a living body of Christ for many members. The church is uniquely related to Christ as head of the body. Members of the church are uniquely related to every other member. And a church is on mission with Christ in our world to carry out the Father's redemptive purposes. So uh, what we'll do in this next uh, little while is look at each one of these and try to have some kind of scripture to back those up. Now, here I've got uh, the NIV, and here I've got the message. That's my two favorite uh, versions. Well, really, the, the, my, my other favorite version is the uh, uh, NRSV. Well, let, me, let me switch vehicles here just a minute. Devices. My favorite uh, scripture thing is Takara, uh, uh, T-E-C-A-R-T-A. -E okay, and so here I've got both both versions uh, on this too. All right, let's see. What scripture was it I had up there that we were supposed to look at? My short-term memory these days is about as long as my hair. <laughs> okay. Matthew 16. And I think this has the books alphabetized. But, uh, okay. All right, now, this is what I like about this one. Once I start it with a little bit, then it matches up the two, two versions. And then I set it where it just barely goes at reading speed. Mm -hmm. So then I can sit there and and read, you know, and even glance back it over. And if I want to stop, I just touch it. It stops. And then it picks up. Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus says, but what about you? What, he asked, who do you say that I am? Well, Simon Peter, a lot like a lot of us, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. All right, the question that I've got for you is, what does, and I tell you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church? What does that mean? It's we are the church. It means we are the church. Now, what? how did the Catholics interpret this? That Peter was the original pope. And that, that Peter was the, you know, the person of Peter was what he was basing the church on. But what did Peter just say back in that earlier verse? 
You are the Messiah. So now, to me, it just doesn't make much sense for Jesus to say, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. But if I go back and look at that... Uh, <laughs> but back here when it says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are the Messiah. So now to me, that's what he's talking about that he's going to build the church on. The rock that he's going to build. That, that part, the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah is not going to change. And I don't do much Greek, but uh, I did go crank up one of those Greek versions. And Miss Tina, best I can tell, they use two different words for rock in there. Which would imply that it was Peter's statement about the Messiah, and not Peter himself, that the uh, uh, rock was being built on. All right, now, this morning, what was the sermon about? Francis. Francis of Assisi. And the pastor talked a whole lot about the Pope. Well, we ain't Catholics. <laughs> so was it all right for him to talk about the Pope in the Baptist church? Well, are we going to see any Catholics when we get to heaven? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, for him to say, okay, here's a pope that's doing what? He is making news. Coming out of the, uh, where he was, whatever the process was, and instead of jumping on, on the pope machine, jumping in the little bus and riding it back, that was, that, you know, those, those people guarding him and stuff, they must have been going crazy. Because they had been told what? Protect this man at all costs. Don't let anything. And you know, he just walks out and instead of getting in the car, you know, comes around, jumps on the little transit bus, and boom, they take him back to the to his his place. So he, you know, he is doing things the way he believes Christ would do it. So this is causing ripples, big waves, not ripples, big waves in the Catholic Church. But a lot and, of bishops voted for him. Hmm? A lot of bishops had to vote for him. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and, and so some of the ways our people are for it, some of them are against it. So anytime that you bring change, you know, but now that they put him in, the Catholic Church will not be able to go back to where it was a few months ago. Even if they throw him out and bring somebody else in, there's going to be a group that say, now this is the way it could be. First Baptist Church will never be the same again. You know, if we think that we're going to go back to where we were, and you know, I hear people keep saying, oh, well, I wish I could go back to so and so. I wish I could go back to 1950. I ain't going with them. <laughs> you know, in my house, we had an outhouse. <laughs> in the morning, I got up and milked two cows. There's several things that I don't have to do now that I was doing then that I'd rather not, you know, rather not keep doing. I can't tell you how many hours I followed a mule. You know, from the time I was about 13, 12 or 13, on up to my early 20s. Wild and corn, tobacco, and, you know, and, uh, and all that stuff. I'm kind of thankful that I don't have to do that again. Uh, you, know, find, you know, find other things to do. But, you know, this thing of, one of the things that we, I mentioned this in your class this morning, all you ladies who've given birth, there after a little while of labor, your life changed. You'll never be able to go back to what it was before that. Changed drastically, didn't it? Just that little thing coming into your life. And it changed for Daddy too. So you see, you can't, you know, 
You know, it's just like having a wreck. If I could just go back five seconds, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but you can't. You know, the front end's already messed up. So, so you know, dear church, we are living, we are in the experience. Now, that does not mean that we cannot practice what the Lord has taught us. Forgiveness, love, patience, kindness. So now those things are, are with us and we are able to practice those things all the time. So, you know, we don't, we don't need to forget that. All right, little fella. If you're going to go to sleep on me, I'll just throw you out. Switch back to this other machine. Okay. All right, we got that rock straightened out. That section of scripture, there are books written on it. I mean, big books. There is controversy about what Christ meant when he said, you know, on this I will fill my church. Ephesians 4 11. Not only did Christ create the church, but he equips the church. So now, oh, I got to be good. Okay. Brian will like this. that script? Oh, she was not up there. <laughs> 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 That's called the femur. All right, so I can hide that femur. So now, what's wrong with this body? I'm not walking too many. Yeah. If, if he tries to walk, I got news for him. He's going to end up on the floor. All right, now that body doesn't just have a leg. This is a bones in the human body. All right, now let's add a little. Uh, let's add some arteries to this body. So now, if I want to study one of these little arteries right here, I just touch it. It comes up. Says that's the posterior intercostal artery. Man, if I just had this when I was in college, good. <laughs> that would have just just been fabulous. All right, now if uh, I want to add some veins to this. All right, now I got my veins. Oh, my goodness gracious, this fellow here is just carrying on something awful. All right, but what's happening to the number of parts in this body? All right, let's add some nerves to this. That one thought is kind of slow down here. All right, let's add some muscles to it. All right, you get the point? Yeah. And see, I can add the muscles in layers. Then I can click on any one of them. Now, if I buy the professional version of this software, it's from Stanford University, it costs me about $100. But it, every part, every insertion, every little part of a bone is labeled there. And the medical students and other people who do with medicine are buying this by the scales. Stanford is making them a nice little uh, fortune on it. But also, there are a bunch of other people that are taking these apps and you know, making them now. Which part of this could I remove and and not bother that body? Well, I guess you could take out the appendix. <laughs> well, do you reckon the appendix is Dean Jones? He would like the appendix was put there by God and in our church body Teresa that's probably has a function now what if the appendix never figures out what it's supposed to do 
take it out of space. And that's when you take it out. Except, you know, for us in church, we better be real careful about who we think we take out. Now, some people come along and say, okay, you know, we got a thousand members of this church. Last year we saw only 400 of them, so let's clean the rolls up. So who's going to go through and take these names and say, you know, erase him, erase him, erase her? Rather than doing that, what do we need to be doing? We need to be picking up the phone. We need to be sending an email. We need to be going out to call the fruit nursery and seeing somebody out there that hadn't seen in a while. Sit down and talk to them a few minutes. We need to be going over to Jenny Newton's and sit down and talking with David and visiting with him. We need to be going over to Betsy Dalton's and making sure that Spurgeon is taken care of these next two weeks. Uh, and, and look, Spurgeon will get taken care of. But you know, David Newton is fairly new. So it's real easy for us to forget David right now. And every once in a while, God sends somebody and they decide that they aren't going to be a member of the church yet. Uh, and for some reason, they, you know, don't, they don't join the church. So what do we say about them? But now they've been coming. They've been fellowshipping with us. And we got some that are coming to church and they have not joined the church because they were in the Catholic Church, Presbyterian Church. They were sprinkled and they are scared to death of water and they don't want to get baptized. <laughs> <clears throat> so they come, they fellowship with us, but they don't join the church. So are we responsible for them? Yes. If they are a part of our fellowship, yes, we are responsible for them. So one of the things that I firmly believe that God would have us do is to begin to take care of the body. Where's Jim Smith? Jim had a little problem with his toe. <laughs> So, you know, here he sits on the lounge up there with his toe up in the air, with her all wrapped up and everything, you know. And, and Jim said, I didn't realize what, 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 what could happen to you when you just have a little problem with your toe. I don't know, did Phil's problem start with his toe? Or was it bigger, you know? But, you know, you can get an infection in your toe, and what can it do? run right on up your leg and if you don't go get something done about it you, you know you go you could lose your life so you know here in the body the question is you know well, these muscles can I just cut out and throw away which bone can I cut out well you know none of them now I may be able to rearrange some pieces and parts like I was talking to somebody the other day and they were having kidney problems so what could they do <coughs> Take out one kidney because you have two. So then they could live with one kidney. But now after they take out that one kidney, if something happens to the other one, they on the dialysis. And you know, all the time. So you know, we could come up with all kinds of reasons why we can find a way to uh, say we can take some of this out. But the gifts, Jesus, by, by in the church, he gave each one of us gifts. Something that we can do. The gifts he gave were some that would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the body, building up the body of Christ. Until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Have sit down and say, God, you know, I want the gift of being knowledgeable in math. I think that already was in him and it was not much he could do that. You work with animals pretty good. Not just surgery and stuff, but you literally love those little books. And so people come to your clinic because you take care of them so well. And they see that you love them. And so you have not had a problem with people coming back and back and back. Now there might have been one, two, three years that got a little active. But I bet they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we could go around the room and each person 
Marcus, did you think you were going to be working with kids when you were five years old? Really hadn't crossed your mind yet, had it? Nothing crossed my mind at five. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Tim was in seminary. Now, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess all y'all know that my son Tim was a pastor up in Beverly, Massachusetts. His family's name Beverly, and his father's name Beverly. Mm -hmm. uh, right on the, on the northern shore, shore of Boston, right by Boston. But I remember when he was in seminary, he called me one time and says, Daddy, when y'all come up here, bring your camera. I said, why? Well, I'm taking this old preaching course, but I'm not going to be a preacher. <laughs> okay. What you got to do? He says, well, we're going to go over there in the auditorium. I'm going to get down there and preach, and you're going to get up there, and you're going to film me preaching. And then I'll take it in there and give it to that professor and let him look at it. I said, okay, okay. So we did. He got up there and preached. And, you know, I kept the camera right on him so that nobody could see that there was nobody in the auditorium but him. <laughs> <laughs> so we found it. He gave it to the to the professor, and he got an A. Well, then he got out of seminary. First job he got, he was doing what he wanted to do. He wanted to go across the world for Jesus, you know. So he ended up in Kenya and different places. The church hired him to be the one to lead all of their mission stuff. Well, when he got back, there was a bunch of young people, like a lot of y'all here, in the church that he was at. And so the pastor asked him to start a night service for those people. So he did. Well, he ended up about 200, 250 people at that night service at Falls Church, Episcopal Church. It was going really good. Then the pastor up there said, I want you to go start a church. That's how he ended up in Maine. And now that's how he's back in Massachusetts. But he clearly said to me, and by now, you know, he's 22 or 3, I am not going to preach. <laughs> but it turns out that one of his gifts is preaching. So now he's pretty proud of some of his uh, works. If you want to, to listen to some of his sermons, go on ChristTheRedeemer.org. They're in Massachusetts. You can listen to those sermons. I'm sure you'll run home and start listening. <laughs> All right. Every member has been placed in the church according to God's plan to accomplish His purposes for that place and time. So what Blackaby is saying, the guy who wrote The Experience of God, he's saying God has put us in place so that we can accomplish what He has for us and each one of us has our thing to do. Now, can you give me some examples of folks around the church here that you have seen doing something that seems so easy for them, it's just absolutely natural, they're really in their element doing what they're doing here at church? The styres in the garden. The styres in the garden. Mm -hmm. The Ramirez at World Hunger. Okay, the Ramirez at World Hunger. Miss Lib with children. Miss Lib with children. Watched her for years, didn't you? Oh, by the way, I'm celebrating this year, my 50th year at this church. <coughs> first year that I came, first service I came to was in 1963. <coughs> now, now, there was a little while before I joined because I was doing student teaching, so I only got to come, you know, during that core of you know, during the student teaching. That's when I met Spurgeon. All right, any other? Bev, Bev and teaching. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if, if I have a gift, you know, teaching has, has been a part of it, and uh, thank you for that. Others? Kevin taking care of babies. Kevin? Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kevin <laughs> is the next Mr. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> He's the next, next Mr. Paul. Now, we got some fairly new folks over here, not counting late. <laughs> now, in the coming years, we will discover. Now, I got to make a little line over there too. So, you know, but we'll discover what your gifts are. It may be what you think it is now. It may not be. You know, uh, I'm one who believes that sometimes we have a little struggle discovering exactly what it is God wants us to do. Now, you say, well, what should we do? And I'd say just keep on doing something until you really find out that part that you just love. 
you know, I enjoy coming to World Hunger, sorting stuff so much, just meeting people and greeting people and, and moving stuff around and doing, you know, uh, those those kind of things. So, you know, God will give you a passion to do things that you want to do. All right, now here's this old question again. What is your belief about membership in the church? And some people just wander around, coming down the road and say, mm -hmm, there's a nice church. Let's stop and go to that church today and see, see what's there. Or is God behind this? Had a man one time came to church. We were, we were doing, uh, Judy and I were doing the welcome class, and he wanted to know, did we handle snakes? <laughs> so I had to tell him that we did not handle snakes. Well, just as soon as he could excuse himself, he left. He was from the mountains, and the church that he was at in the mountains actually handled snakes. So, you know, when we got through, uh, he... And then I've heard stories of people who, who literally are going up down the road. They would go by here on the way to work, you know, and they would see the church and see the church, and then they go home and talk, and all of a sudden they'd say, well, I saw that church up there. Uh, I, I, you know, let's go up there and try that church. And, you know, so, you know, this is something that really we need to look at the Scriptures seriously about. What is God doing in our church? How is He placing the people in the church and what is, how does he want us to deal with that? All right, the church is a living body of Christ, many members. And I just want to skip that. You already know that. You know, each one of these things we could develop. Oh, my goodness. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> What's her name? Ruby. Ruby. Ruby, did you know that when you were this long that my wife and I came and visited you? You don't even remember, do you? <laughs> the body owns the buildings, but the buildings are not the church. So now when we think of the word church, how do we train our minds to think of God's people when we hear the word church? Instead of thinking of the place or the buildings. It's a plural for members. Church members, you know, members of this body equals church. So we are all important. God needs each one of us here. He put us here. All right, now, the, the church is uniquely related to Christ as head of the body. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to go head of over everything for the church. So now, who is in charge of this church? Dean Jones. we can't remove it. <laughs> So we can't remove it then, right? <laughs> Don't we get caught up in that trap of, you know, a de Dean, Lord. Oh, Dean, I don't know when I first met you. I don't believe y'all were married yet. He was wandering the halls of the Lord. Oh, is that? <laughs> okay, Dean was running up that one of those kids that run up down the halls at North without a hall pass. <laughs> okay. Now, as chairman of the deacons, you know, sometimes when we point our anger at him, we need to be pointing at Jesus Christ. He can take it. And he will help us deal with that. Now, if we point it at humans, we're not going to get much done. 
because they're already doing what they think is the best, you know, what they think is the best thing to do. So, you know, we need to be thankful of our deacons. And even if we don't understand what they're doing, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But we need to let Jesus be the head of the church. You know, when I get this idea, okay, you know, we need to do this. Let's say I sent an email to Tom and Dean this week. I don't know why Judy called me, but Judy Melkor called me and says, we can't have the dental bus down there no more until y'all do something about that stinking basement. The water is three inches deep over there. I don't know when she went and looked at it. Well, I, I really would hate to see the dental bus leave us because the, the dent, you can't start the dental clinic till 6 o'clock because the technicians and stuff are volunteers. So they leave their office at 5 and they get miss supper and come over here at 6. And, and then the buses stop running at 7. So for the people of Huntersville to go up to Ada Jenkins where they're going to have the clinic, it's almost impossible. So I was just, you know, saying there's something we can do to, to get this clinic back down here. They really want it to be down here. But it's a problem that we, the church, need to work through. You know, and part of the question is, do we want the dental clinic here? If we do, then we have to work on a way to, you know, to get that done. And Dean, my question is, I started, I started saying, I'm not even going to mention that tonight, but, you know, the more people who know about that, that, somebody may come up with a solution that we never heard of. They may come back and say, well, look, my uncle has this company, you know, and he'll come over here and clean them, that gum, blow out them leaves or whatever it is in those pipes or whatever's going on, and, you know, we may find somebody who will help us out with that. So, you know, sometimes we think, well, you know, I just assume for the body not to know that the dental clinic's not meeting down here now, and because uh, we don't know what we're going to get done, whereas on the other hand, it might be the best thing in the world for people to know it. So one of the things that we need to work on is communication and getting that information out so that it can be helpful to uh, people to do that. So now, with Christ as the head of the body, then the first thing that I needed to do was go get on my knees where I pray, beside the bed, and ask God to help, help with this situation. You know, God, what do you want us to do? And how are we to get this solved? And, you know, and I don't need to be doing that by myself. And if I'm part of the body, then the body needs to be helping uh, with that decision. All right, Ephesians 4.15, instead of, instead of speaking truth and love, we will grow to become every, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every support and ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The only thing I don't like about that little thing I showed you a while ago, they hadn't fixed it yet to where I put the skin on it. <laughs> and I put the muscles and the nerves and the blood and, you know, and, and all these things, but the, the skin. So somebody, don't worry, somebody will come up with, you know, how to get the skin on that. All right, now members of the church are uniquely related to every other member. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now all these is referring to the gifts. Now the gifts are kind of spread out in the Bible, and it's a little bit confusing, but we can get it, you know, worked on and work on it. All right, now I want us to go to can I skip this? Read could I give you a sign to go home and read 1 Corinthians 12? I got an activity that I want to do, so I'm going to skip this. Okay? Oh, uh, now, members of the church are uniquely related to every other member of the body needs all of its parts working together. Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets. Now, this is just in Ephesians. Uh, that uh, goes back to that very same thing. Uh, and we're going to skip that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what I wanted to do, I think it is powerful when we read the scriptures to each other. I think it is really powerful. Roberta, do you remember those times we had Bible reading marathons? We cannot read how long. A couple of times we did 24 hours. We had spiritual terms. <laughs> 
Everybody. That, that was power. That was power. Now, God gives us clear direction both the Old and New Testament reading the scriptures. But there are a couple of things that we can do to, to help us with that. This is the same Leviticus 19. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor yourself. I am the Lord. And then there's another version there. And I like this version. Do not try to believe. Vengeance belongs to God. Stop being angry. And don't try to take vengeance. I am the Lord and I command you to love others as much as you love yourself. Same verse. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I thought one was going to be in here. Mm -hmm. Tom can read it. Tom. All right. Tom Floor. Oh, it. Tom Floor? Yeah. Want me to read it? Yeah. No te vengas ni guardarás rencor a los hijos de tu pueblo, sino amarás a tu prójimo como a ti mismo. Yo soy Jehová. I like this right here. I am the Lord. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. We don't use show quite in that way. <laughs> <laughs> but by looking at different versions now, here's something that's pretty neat. It, see, this says uh, chapter, context, and... Uh, uh, Leviticus 19.18. Alright, if I click this, that's a link that takes me to BibleGateway.com. And there's that verse. Ooh, it's an owl or something. Alright, and then right down here is a thing that says, give me this verse, Leviticus 19.18, in all English translations. So if I click that, then it gives me about 40 different versions <coughs> of just that verse. <coughs> And see, if you've got a particular verse and something in it you're trying to hash out, what do they mean by this two words or one word or whatever, that's just really a good, great uh, Bible study tool. And so uh, I like to use that. But also, you know, if I click back, it goes back to chapter 18. If I click forward, it goes up to chapter 19. I keep looking at all the chapters and all of that. Do y'all use BibleGateway.com? It's just got a lot of neat uh, features in it. And also it's got uh, uh, a couple of things. I've got to get in some of these little things. So here I can add a parallel edition to this web thing too, see. If you pick it up, if you did 30 minutes a day, how many hours you stayed the Bible during a year? Now, now I don't mean this thing of, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to stay my Bible so you can get a cup of coffee. A little snack, you know, and you come around and you come back and you sit down and already used up 15 minutes. Oops, I gotta go, you know. So I'm going 30 minutes up. I mean, you do 30 minutes of Bible study. You start the clock when you sit down and start with the Bible. But if you do 30 minutes a day, it is amazing how much you work through in a year. Absolutely amazing. Boy, if you got, you know, 40 or 50 years to work on it. It's that much, much more amazing. All right, let's get back to the main thing. Okay. And this section on being, uh, you shall be holy for I am holy. These are the things that, that uh, like you told us, being is more important than doing. I can, you can call me and say, hey, hey Bill, come up here to the church and break some leaves. I can do that. You say, hey, come up here and cut down and help saw off this tree that fell over the other thing. I can do that. But in my heart, in relation to you, it's really easy for me to get out of joint. It's really easy for me to be grumbling and carrying on while I am doing. I can even teach a Sunday school class out of duty. And I can teach it out of love. Now, if I'm doing it out of duty, God knows that. 
And then the people in that class are literally not growing. They're just existing. So now what God wants is for us to be holy because He is holy. Now actually this goes back, back to Leviticus. This is a quote from Leviticus. Alright, God wants His people to display unity. Uh, John 17, what is that? The prayer that Jesus gave before He went to the cross. He prayed for us. He said He was going to hold us up and that He would take care of us. And then the next one is God wants His people to love one another. Oh, the another got run off somewhere. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 13 is one of the really good, good scriptures for that. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrong. How often do you hear, I'll forgive you, but I ain't gonna forget it. <laughs> that means you're doing what? Keeping a record. And sometimes in there saying, all right, I'll let it go this time, but next time, you know, it's, you will pay for it. Now, Sorry, I'll skip to these real quick. Now, here's what I want you. Now, this time I'm going to tell you what to do before you get out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want you in groups of four. All right, I want a reporter. Somebody's going to come back and tell the group what you decide. All right now, <laughs> church needs to make a decision about the following. This is not real, but it ought to be. Some people from a nearby park have been invited to FBC. An invitation was given by Jim White, Alice White, Beverly Stires, Sandy Wallace, Kate. Those people that work at Lincoln's Law. These are usually poor people. The children are not well kept, not well behaved. Some of the parents are drug users, excessive alcohol use. Some have been arrested and convicted, stealing food and other stuff. They lie and cheat. Many feel that nobody loves them. These people are on our campus every week. Well, they're not the same ones. They only come every 60 days. But we used to see 30 or 40 of them, 50, some weeks 100. Uh, they say that we don't have a place for them in our church. If I invite them to Sunday school, they say, you don't want me over there. You don't want my kids over there. You're a rich church. You, you have no place for us. Decision number one that your group has to make. Do we want to have them in our church? Two, does FC, FBC belong to the members? Three, what, what would he, Jesus, do with these people? Four, what would be the cost to us to provide a Bible classes for these people? Sophie said the other day she missed a test, so she went into the teacher, and the teacher handed the test, and she said, I went up there, Grandpa, and I said, I looked there, and I didn't know nothing on it, not <laughs> a one question. So I said, I got up, and I carried it back to him, and says, I, I don't know any of this stuff. He looked at it, and he said, oh, I gave you the wrong test. <laughs> 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 All right. Early 1980s, the church chose 
to build a building for the people of the community behind the ARP church, right back over here. What do we call that community, Dean? What was that meal? We used to call it Mill Hill. Mackler yeah. Mill Hill, yeah, Mackler yeah, Mill Hill. Okay, so we were thinking about building the Family Life Center. But we voted instead, God got a hold of us. Instead of building the Family Life Center, we voted to go over there and build a building for them. Well, they used it a few years, and then they called some little old pepper snapper preacher, and he ups and sailed the dad young thing to the Moravians, and goes up, up the road there, and that's Christ Community Church now. Okay? But we, we, instead of working our tails off to get them over here, we went over there beside a railroad track. How far is that? <laughs> and within walking distance, we go over there and build the church. Well, but at least we did something for those people. All right, then in 1989, tra trailer park over yonder. Uh, Wildwood Green. Wildwood Green. Wildwood Green. No, it's now called Huntington Green. I always call it Wildwood Green, it was but Wildwood I have been Green informed Green. that it's now. Huh? It was Wildwood Green. Okay, but anyway, we went over there, we, we built, we took the lead in helping to build the church. Went over there in 1989, 4th of July, and we had put down the foundation jewel, you know, just the, the, the subfloor, and that week that church raised up, and they had services on Sunday. That was awesome. I got the wettest I ever got in my whole life. I was standing under the edge, putting up the, what is that stuff, under the socket. Nailed it up, and it was raining, and the water's just running right. <laughs> my pocketbook was wet, all my money was wet. I mean, everything. I've never been that wet. All right, so this is a little bit of history of two of those kind of decisions that we faced in the community and what we did with it. So now, this is the one that we're facing that I'm giving you the problem to face today. You have that done in 10 minutes. <laughs> so what's really important now, maybe the most important thing that we've done today, is to pay attention to each other. In other words, try to get out of your mind, you know, all these things that we have going on in there, and, and listen to what God is saying to us through the body about this situation. All right, do we want to have them in our church? First group. Yeah. yeah, stand up. Does anybody have the young lady in here? That's what happens when you're like, automatically, you say, yeah, because you take that as like the church is. So, like, yeah, we let anybody in your church, like, no matter the circumstances. And I feel like the only possible cause for them to not be let in is because they're not, like, morally good. And that's, like, the entire mission of the church is to let people have forgiveness and let them be like redeemed. And the uh, verse that I chose, that we chose, um, Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And if we don't show them love and we don't show them compassion, then they're just going to stay with, like how they are and they're not going to change. Thank you. Just good. For the same question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, my group picked the appendix to talk, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we said yes as well, and, so, you know, and, and Jesus taught us to love one another, so how can we say no to, to ex, you know, exclude, to exclude anyone? And, uh, uh, and so, and, Along with that, a challenge for us would be to to seek ways that we can make them feel welcome. Okay. Because that was, that's a barrier for me of those folks, and that was to so eliminate the barrier. Yeah, you gotta eliminate that barrier. So how do we do that? This group. You said yes. Do I have to stand up? Yes, you have to stand up. He's the He's the He's the He's the He's the He's the And we also said because uh, that we should love one another, and that we're supposed to take care of each other, you know, no matter who we are. 
whether we're poor, rich, whatever, we need to be taking care of everyone. Okay. Okay. All right. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And if you skip down to verse 45, he says, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, And as much as ye did it not unto one of the least, ye did it not unto me. And these shall go away into inter eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And where he went on to say, If you don't do it to them, then it's just as you didn't do it to me. Um, we said yes also, but when push comes to shove, do we always say yes? Mm -hmm. Just sometimes it turns to a no based on situations. Um, but we ha um, we found in Romans 2, it starts out, if you think you can judge others, you are wrong. When you judge them, you're really judging yourself guilty because you do the same things they do. And then it's, um, it's a great chapter, skip down to 11. For God judges all people in the same way. Okay. We said yes. We definitely want that. And we used um, the Great Commission, Matthew 28. There, oh, you got to stand there. Even though you're first. <laughs> There's a little favor to them. Sorry. <laughs> so we said Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make. Uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Very good. Okay. All right. Or go to that next slide, please. Okay, now this one, uh, we're going to... Uh, uh, does FC, FBC belong to the members? We're just going to do this one real quick because the other two, I, I really want to get in on those answers, okay? So, uh, any, any particular comment on that? Well, the cross. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Yes, the church belongs to Jesus. <laughs> not to their faith. Not to the appendix. It belongs to Jesus Christ. It's just really important that we, you know, we, we sometimes we get excited and we, we think it's our church. But it, it you know, we, we, it, it belongs to Jesus, not to us. All right, next slide. All right. What? What would he do with these people? This is what I'm going to do quick, too. The last one is not going to do it. He'd recognize their needs and reach out immediately. All right, he'd recognize their needs and reach out immediately. To he'd be right there out among them because he ate with the sinners and the tax collectors. We took it a little differently as in what would he do with them as servants of his. And so we talked about Jacob and Esau and how Jacob deceived his brother and lied to his brother and stole from his brother and then turns around to do great things for God. Mm -hmm. And what happened with his brother? What happened to Esau? Yeah. I don't know, you tell me. But God even ended up using it, not, not in the way we might think, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, he did use them a little bit. All right, other other comments. He probably would recognize individual strengths in others and try to encourage them to use those strengths in in that group setting. Yeah, and, and I, by us not bringing them into the church, what are we missing? A blessing. We're missing their gifts. God has gifted them just like He has gifted us. So, you know, we might find somebody a great pianist. We might find a great teacher. We might find a great uh, Bible scholar. We might find a preacher. Who, who was it? Uh, Moody? That was selling shoes in the shoe store? And turned out to start one of the greatest revivals in America? You know, it's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and Moody Bible Institute? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just 
goes on and on. All right, last one. Next one. Oh, there's no next one. No, oh, there it is. Okay. okay, sorry. There it is. All right. All right, what will it cost the members of FBC to provide a Bible study? Supposing that we decided that we really want to reach out to these people, what would it cost us? Group one. No. You got to go back to slide one. Thank you, Gene. All right. Come back and give us an answer to slide one. Oh, we got it. Okay. Yeah, we got to go. I'm sorry. I thought, why did y'all pause? We just thought you were trying to wrap No. <laughs> uh, okay, we had uh, had two verses, uh, and I had already flipped with uh, a different verse yeah. here. So we had uh, Matthew 9.36. Uh, 9.36. And we saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then we also had Ephesians uh, 4, verse 4. Uh, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now that is that verse is a really great summary. It really is. Okay. He said yes, and we use Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all of you who are weak and heavy laden. Okay. So Jesus also invited, not just us, but Jesus had invited them into the church, and we are the church. We had um, John ten sixteen. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep, and I must bring them also. They too will listen. So these are some of those other sheep. Yes, I have Peter 3, 9, 2. As someone, um, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Okay, now. Last group. Last group. We said yes as well. That's and we use. We use Matthew uh, 19, verse 14, when Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now, y'all get to go first on question. Is there another group? Yes, you do. Huh? What's your answer? What's your answer? I've, been praying, I've been praying for us, to God, to lead us to do something for ten years. Well, it'll be 10 years February the 4th. It hurts my heart to see those little children. And now I know some of those little children are in church, and I know that not all of them, you know, are going to... We're not going to just be able to bring them here to church. But I honestly believe that we could do better than nothing. Uh, you know, I, I, and, and I don't know, this last part, you know, how would we do it? You know, we may have to start some backyard Bible clubs. We may have to uh, just go over there and do a hot dog cookout and say, look, we have a hot dog cookout on Saturday afternoon. All the little all people are invited, you know, and then have some of the people who say they, they'd be willing to work with them. And, you know, and then just start up a class over here and say, okay, you know, we're going to have a class uh, for uh, folks of Lydia's Law. And, and, you know, we may go six months with nobody there. So it, it's not an easy task. It's uh, something that, if it was easy, see, we'd already be doing it. So, what was the significance of that day 10 years ago? Uh, Leaders all started February 4th in 2004. That was when we opened the door, opened the door for people to, to uh, start shopping. Now, we actually started back in about now, well, back in June of 2003, you know, renovating the building, getting all of the, jumping through all the hoops and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. But it was actually February the 4th of 2004 before we opened the door and said, come on in and shop. So we make it February 4th, 2014, I believe, 10 years. 
And we need a bigger building. But I'm, that's another, that's another <laughs> argument. That's another kind of thing. All right, fourth question. Y'all look first. Fourth. One of the things we said that it would take would be our time. Um, and uh, going and going through our house and even looking at, uh, they may not have resources, so Bibles that we've gathered through the all of, you know, through our lifetime that we have sitting on shelves that aren't being put to use because we get a new one each year or for Christmas or a gift. You know, taking the resources that we have in our house and providing them and bringing them so that others might have a resource to to have on in hand. Okay. Next group. We didn't get to that one. You didn't, all right. That's, that's okay. But we had said time as well. We they did a fantastic job on the first three. Okay. Well, we didn't talk about time. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, it, in many cases, it may take some patience on our part. You know, it, when you think about when you get in, say, uh, a classroom, especially like, you know, a group of kids, and they're not used to maybe being in a Sunday school classroom like our kids have grown up in, it takes patience. Yes, yes. It's a whole new moment. Mm -hmm. whole new moment. But now, look, don't we experience a little bit of this at, uh, I mean, at World Hunger? See, we have some of those kids coming to World Hunger. That's why we got to keep World Hunger going. I don't think we realize the significance of what the community sees at World Hunger. How many of them see Jesus? And do we invite them while they're there shopping? Yes. Of course, now it could be like me and Ernie went out one time to this house over yonder along the railroad track, and the man brought his wife out and told us not to come back to get off his property. <laughs> So we did. Promptly. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, we said we you, we need dedicated teachers. We, you, but I agree with Kevin. You have to have patience. I, you have to have a presence over there. You have to go there and play ball with those people. You have to go go just hang out over there to build to build those relationships. Because otherwise, you know, a lot of those people are not going to feel comfortable coming up here. Maybe we do need to have it back. We might have to volunteer at Lady Slump. Might have to volunteer at Lady Slump. And, and get to know those kids. One of the great joys that I have, used to have, I have this past year, but sitting down and reading to some of those little kids. Reading the little girl one day, reading the book. And right, what was in the book? She grabbed the book and says, that's not what's in that book. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why not take Spanish lessons from Tom? You, you, you may, you may. So, you know, one of the questions that we need to ask is, what is it that we are willing to do to provide for God's people that He has put here in our midst? That's us. All right. Our number one thing, John just said, is we need to remove the labels and realize that they're not a different people and we don't need a different class and we don't need their own thing. And once they realize we accept them as we are, they won't feel that need to be separated either. An opportunity coming up, we have our family fun farm night, last Saturday of the month. I still need volunteers, and okay. I need people to go over there and invite them to come Good. and let them know it's free, and we want you to come and hang out with us and have a pie eating contest. But we have taken our children out of the public schools and away from those people that we're talking about because mm -hmm. they're nasty and dirty, and we don't want our children associating with so we have to remove the labels that we have given them and realize they're just people. And all, most all of y'all went to school with them. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I went to school with some rascals. <laughs> I said you were one of the rascals. <laughs> I probably was. <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we were all there together. Okay. All right, who was the next group? We didn't get that far. All right. Um, we said a lot of what you guys said, commitment and just uh, adjustment in the way we think as far as, you know, our preconceived notions of them and how, you know, we 
but what we expect from them and, you know, taking the labels off and um, dealing with, you know, um, you know, kids that maybe don't get discipline at home like we did growing up or things like that and kind of having the patience with that and, you know, being committed to it. <coughs> I have one question. Okay. Why do we call them those people? Mm -hmm. <coughs> by eight times now. <coughs> Terry, did you say something insightful? Because I can't hear it. <laughs> she said, why do we call them those people? Or them. Or Because I didn't know any other word to use to, to speak of that particular segment of the population that I'm talking about right now. And I, I certainly understand it. It's just, I, I see that and hear that a lot. Yes. And they're yes. God's children. Dr. And Doug and I call them the invisible people. people that we tend not to see. All right. This group. All right. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. We, we said the same that for this, to have space to do it um, and the time and, you know, the people that are willing to, to do it, to volunteer to teach them. Like, you know, Dr. Richard, would you give up your Sunday school space if you thought you could bring in four, five, ten kids to take that space and be willing to go out on an oak tree and have your Sunday school class? It was free. We said some saying that we require commitment by each of us to uh, uh, by all of our, all of the church. Reach out to them and to include, to include them. And we might have to step out of our comfort zone to go to them. Okay, I got a question, but I'll hold it for me. Okay. Um, we listed all of like the things we've been saying, like time, resources, money, people. We we'll also have to sacrifice like our standards, and like you can't say if they're if they do this and if they act like this, then I'm not gonna do them. I'm not gonna fellowship with them. I'm not gonna worship with them. And we're not going to be able to just like change our way of thinking just like that. But eventually over time it will change as we get to know the people and like listen to them and talk to them. Great. Great observation. <coughs> how, much, how much trouble do you think it would be for us to get this past the church, to get the church to make a motion, to make a motion to the church and to get this rolling? Yeah, I'm sure there would be lots of conversations, <laughs> lots of opinions. <laughs> Well, the first thing we need to do is get on the knees and pray and ask God what He wants us to do. But what is there to approve? I mean, we could walk out today and go invite them to come tomorrow. There's nothing to approve. We don't have to ask permission to bring them to church. We get too lost in the politics and the 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 well, the people. I mean, they have four and a half year olds. Like I have a four and a half year old, and we have classrooms for four year olds. So right. Why would we need? Something different, right. but it's, it's not happening. Happening. I'm trying. It's not happening. I mean, you know, I, I agree with you. I agree with you that we ought to bring them in, just mix them right in with who we are. And actually, it'll be much easier to mix the children. I don't see the children as being a problem. But the adults are another whole issue. Jerry. Well, I was just going to say the, the question around what is your personal belief? And, and what is your commitment to do? If if you see someone, then Jesus had, I mean, I think it is our own responsibility to reach out to whoever is in our path at whatever place we are and share God's love with them, encourage them to come to church, whether it's here or wherever, but that we, we do that. And I think it's a, a personal commitment. I mean, I grew up was a father who took a station wagon through Wildwood Green and we were packed in the car. And not only did we do that, but we went to the prison and picked up prisoners to come to this church. So... You don't have to resurrect him. Miss <laughs> 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 Tina, would you uh, care to say a word? Or? Well, I've kind of been in and out, so I'm a little hesitant because I've missed chunks okay. of it. 
protection on the children, but I'll just go back to where we were at the first, where we started about. We love doing world hunger. I've just heard a great report from Haiti. We love going to Ukraine. We certainly had a great time in West Virginia showing love. And our greatest challenge now is to love one another here. Right, right here in that right church. Right here. Right here in that church. All right, do you have something else that's something to say? Well, it's ten minutes past time to leave. <laughs> Y'all, it's your fault. <laughs> uh, you're flexible. Okay. Well, look, I just want to say I love every one of you. And I appreciate so much your being here tonight. And I believe God is right here in the middle of this church. But I also believe Satan is stirring up everything that he can. Now, we just got to be strong and make up our mind that we're going to let Jesus be the winner. And sometimes that may mean that I have to participate in some stuff that I don't particularly want to participate in. But if I can, if it will help the fellowship, help the church, help the body, <clears throat> then I need to be willing to do that. Any other statements or comments? Thanks for your willingness to teach. Well, uh, I just want to say this. A couple of people emailed me with some ideas and some of that I incorporated today, some I will get in next week. But if you have some things, particular points that you uh, would like to do, if you will email me, I'll you know try to try to uh, uh, put that in there. And uh, uh, you know, so during these four weeks and toward the, the last session, we want to be a little more specific about our church and some strategies that we might uh, deal with. So I'd love to hear any of that kind of stuff uh, to go along. But I purposely really wanted to get this scripture. Let us pray. Oh, I'll just say one other thing. Uh, we want you to bring other people. We'd like to double this. And we'd like to move next door to the auditorium in two weeks. So don't feel like we if everybody would bring door. one person. If you would go to our church and bring one more person, pray about who God would lay on your heart to invite to come with you that's not here tonight. And we would love in two weeks to move next door. Let's pray. Father, we glorify your holy name, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your gracious love for us. Father, we know there are times when we go our own way, times that we forget about you, times that we fail to trust you. Lord, there are also times that we know know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are carrying us, that you have us in your arms, moving us along. So Lord, I thank you for those times and ask forgiveness for the other times. And Lord, I pray for every person in this room tonight and every person in our body. And Lord, I pray for those three or four hundred that we haven't seen in years. Lord, may you burden our hearts to love each other the way Jesus Christ has loved us and still loves us every day. And Lord, your gifts to us, your care for us, the food that we have, the homes that we have, Lord, uh, you provide for us so well. So Lord, help us in turn to learn how to share even more than we do. And Lord, for those at Lydia's who come, the poor of this community, Lord, it doesn't have to be at Lydia's, but wherever they are. We pray that you would uh, instill within us how to minister to them, how to let, how to help them not be them, but to be us, to join us in worship, and to know that the door is open and that we are willing to do whatever we can to let them know Jesus. So, Lord Jesus. Come and 
let the Holy Spirit strive with us to make us what He needs to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.